Okay, thank you for the invitation, and uh, I hope you will enjoy this uh, this conversation as soon as talking about law at this time of the afternoon can be considered an enjoyable activity. Uh, nonetheless, I will try to to smooth to to make things as uh, as smooth uh, as possible. Anyway. Uh, let's go uh, straight into the, the core of the matter, but uh, please allow me to, to, uh, to do a bit of self-promotion mainly for my, for my books. Actually, I work into the high-tech field since uh, now it's about 30 years. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm some sort of dinosaur who witnessed uh, the whole evolution of information society and cybersecurity in Italy and uh, abroad, as witnessed by the, the various books I wrote during the, this year. My, uh, my, and in my uh, dual capacity of, uh, as a, an academic and as a litigator, I had the chance to, to try in court computer crime cases involving uh, computer virus, hacking, and copyright infringement, and, uh, and so on. As a journalist, I also cooperate with several magazines, including Wired.it and Formica.net, that is um, uh, one of the leading geopolitical magazines here in, uh, in Italy. Uh, as you can see, I wrote about a wide range of topics uh, from encryption to privacy and data protection, national security, and finally, this last book is The Digital Rights Delusion, where there is a chapter on encryption that you might find interesting because it is a recollection of the evolution of the relationship between technology, law, and politics into in, in a relationship with the development of encryption and, and code-cracking techniques. However, let's, let's skip the, the commercial right now and, and, uh, and dive uh, into the agenda. Today we are talking about a topic that is fairly interesting. So we start, uh, I understand that such kind of seminar are usually uh, more of a pra practical nature. However, since we are talking about law and politics, we need uh, necessary, uh, necessarily to have a conceptual framework in which put every, every piece of this puzzle. This is why we are going to start from a theory of power and law and to move then to the definition of what is offensive security, how offensive security is practiced in the, in the markets and in defense military compartments, which are its critical issues. And then we move to a series of real life cases involving, maybe you're familiar with these names, Revy, Lenkrochart and Sky Global ECC, that are the last three major international uh, cases that we will use as an, as an empirical test for the theoretical framework that we are going to, to build in the next, uh, in the next minutes. We, why we need a theory of power and law, because the analysis uh, of the legal status of offensive security implies adopting a specific perspective, point of view in relationship to, uh, to law and power. We are, we are, in the West at least, we are accustomed to think of law as a quasi-religious thing. We always uh, listen uh, especially in this day, that law is above everything, that uh, the constitution rules, and nobody is above the law. But uh, when we uh, when we confront such kind of, stat of statement with uh, uh, with the harsh reality of politics and and geopolitics in particular, well, uh, things may uh, may change significantly. So this is to say that uh, when we talk about law, we have to take a stand. We have to declare where we, what's our take on the relationship between uh, law and power, and in particular, uh, in relationship to the role, sorry for the pun, uh, of the rule of law. This is true in particular when we are uh, talking about offensive security, because as the name implies, and as we will be, we will see in the next, uh, uh, in the next slide, offensive means taking action directed to cause harm. And this is something that should be legal. So uh, we need to, to really understand 
the, uh, the technicality of offensive security to see whether it's legal or not, and in which limit, if any, we can practice this, uh, this approach in, uh, in real life. In particular, what offensive security uh, expose is the fact that the, the line between criminal investigation, national security, and military military operation, it's, uh, it's becoming more and more blurred. Uh, Professor Mancini uh, uh, and I have authored a, a, a paper uh, a few years ago that is still relevant uh, nowadays, by the way, about uh, digital forensics in military operation, in special forces operation. And that was a good exercise to show how the, the very same technical expertise, this paper is a good example of how the, the very same technical expertise, meaning the digital forensics, uh, change legal impact according to the, to the context. Uh, the rule of a, the, the procedural law uh, in uh, uh, usual criminal cases uh, is very different than a procedural law in military time or in military operation. So once again, it's important not only to know about the technicality of uh, forensics or uh, cybersecurity activities, but it's also mandatory, uh, compulsory, I would say, to, to understand the, the legal and political framework in which this competence should be uh, deployed. So what is power? There are lots of definition uh, of this concept. If you ask a psychologist, a lawyer, uh, a philosopher, everybody will, uh, everyone will, uh, will come out with a specific definition. Uh, for the sake of this seminar, we will adopt a very functional definition. This is not the only one. This is not the only possible, but is the one. It is the one that works in the context of the topics we are dealing with this afternoon. So we, we, are, we define power as the ability to obtain control, command and control, uh, the means necessary to achieve uh, an end as determined by an act of will. What does it mean? That means that the king, the ruler, the, the president of, the, of, a, of a republic or the prime minister uh, essentially uh, rule by will. But this, this will cannot be limitless, at least it should not be. Uh, this is why in sovereign states, the power of individuals is limited by rules. We use the, the word rules as an umbrella word in, to include laws, rights, and social, uh, social values. All these rules are, are set by legislature, legislature and enforced by government and social constituency. This is at least the theory, because when we confront this definition with, uh, uh, with the various kind of regimes, that we uh, experience uh, looking at uh, the way single states are governed, uh, well, we, we face essentially uh, a big difference uh, because the, usually the rules uh, works as a, a limit to the power of the rulers. In this case, we are talking about rule of law. Usually we think that the rule of law has been a British invention uh, um, dating back to early 13th, uh, the half of the 13th century with the uh, Magna Carta, but actually the first one talking about the rule of law was uh, Cicerone, that in uh, the, the, the Roman uh, lawyer, the greatest in uh, our community, that in 66, uh, we have to be uh, slaves of the law so that we can live free. So this idea that the, the, that the law should be uh, a superior authority, even in relationship to the, the power of state, uh, it's here for, uh, has been here for a uh, for century or for a millennia. However, in other tradition, mainly Eastern and Far Eastern, Far Eastern, uh, Eastern tradition, there are a different, there is a different approach. The law becomes a, a tool uh, to rule is not a limit to the uh, to the power. In this case, we are talking about rule by law. In the case of the rule by law, we enforce the will of the ruler regardless of the rights of the citizen. While in a rule 
of law, even the state is subjected to the, to the superiority of, of rules. This definition uh, works in the uh, in a domestic in the in the nation within a national perimeter, because when we are facing the relationship between different country uh, between uh, or among uh, sovereign country, then the scenario changes. In international relation, um, rules are more akin to uh, rule by law than to rule of law. In international relation, uh, international relationship, no states will uh, limit its, uh, its own power or its own prerogative. So the law becomes a tool, rules, becomes, uh, rules uh, become a tool to a certain protect national inter interest. Hence the necessity to have treaties and uh, international agreement to handle on a different basis the, the different interests that come, that come into play. In the context of international relationship, a new approach, well, a new for the West, at least, is rising for, uh, for uh, since a few years. This new approach is called lawfare. What is lawfare? It's mainly a U.S. doctrine idea. The idea of lawfare is taking the, the law out, uh, out, of the, uh, out from the courts and using the law as a weapon in the global arsenal of a state. So law become uh, a weapon to defend or to counter attacks coming from abroad. We have several examples of this, of the use of lawfare in every part of the world and in every jurisdiction and in every kind of regime. You are surely familiar with the use of GDPR, the data protection, the European Data Protection Regulation, as a club to be used against the U.S. company, U.S. big tech, to force them to comply with European uh, regulation. The last iteration of this of this clubbing uh, is the Italian data protection attempt to ban chat GPT and shut down open AI uh, activity, or the hyperactivity of the data protection supervisor uh, around Europe uh, against uh, the various uh, big tech. By the way, I'm not working for them. I, I have no conflict of interest in what, I, in what I'm saying. Fact is that in particular, the data protection regulation is a clear example of how the legislation can be used as a, a as a political tool in international relationship. The U European Union is not the only one doing this kind of, of a stunt because, for instance, as we, uh, we will better see in the next slide, the European Union also is proposing a Cyber Solidarity Act that in, in a true uh, 1984 style actually means we, are create we want to create a cyber defense system to retaliate against foreign tax something that uh, the European Union should not have the right to do according to the EU treaty, but that is doing nonetheless. This is a clear example of lawfare, of what happens when, when lawfare is used as a political tool. Russian and Chinese are not less threatening in using this approach because, as you maybe know, China has a similar legislation to the GDPR in so that China asserts its own jurisdiction whenever personal data of Chinese citizens are processed. So with the very same attitude that led the Italian Data Protection Authority to directly issue an order against OpenAI, the Chinese government can do the same virtually with every country in the world. Different approach has been followed by the Russian because, as you maybe know, Russia, Russian legislation makes it mandatory to localize data, Russian citizens, inside the Russian Federation. That means that if you well, now it's just a virtual option, but right before the Ukrainian war started, if you want to have be, to do business with Russia, you had to 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 localize data within its uh, its border. Which